Hello everybody, it's me, Fee, the White Zulu, or rather White Zulu, my mistake, and welcome to my YouTube channel. And I have another chapter for you from my autobiography, White Zulu. And this one is actually two chapters in one. Well, two chapters. And it's just general background, whatever happened on the farm when we were little. And chapter four is the shearing gang. Every spring, the shearing gang arrived. This was a motley collection of up to 15 rough looking Basutu men. Quite unlike our familiar and slightly more fastidious Zulus, who looked down their noses at them with conceal unconcealed distaste. These strangers had beards and rather shaggy hair. They were tribesmen from Basutu land, now called Lesotho, a little known African kingdom high up in the mountains beyond the Drakensberg range. Tied around their shoulders were blankets of ochre and mustard colored wool, intricately patterned with black symbols, and on their heads they wore conical straw hats, the same shape as the thatched roofs of the mud huts in our kraal behind our house. They moved around the district from farm to farm to do the spring shearing. They had a young white man in charge who drove the lorry they traveled in and did all the wool sorting. I don't know where the Basutu slept, but their overseer was billeted in our thatched laundry as far away from the house as possible. Masangu, our Zulu chef, carried his food down on trays and he used the bathroom at our end of the house to shave and wash. We children were deliriously excited when the shearing gang arrived, as it was quite an occasion in our rather understimulated, uneventful lives. We weren't allowed anywhere near the gang, and especially not allowed to speak to the overseer or to hang around him whatsoever. He's a very ordinary little man, sniffed Mum, and he wasn't invited to set foot inside the house other than to come and go through the outside door of the end bathroom to wash. But I remember trying to spy on him through the keyhole of our bathroom while he shaved at the wash basin, not for prurient reasons, but simply because it was something to do. Just watch out, warned Dad, the day the gang arrived. Basutus eat cats, so you'd better hide yours. With terrified squeals, my sisters and I would race off to find our cats. Diana had a big, grumpy, pitch black cat called Vespa after the evening star because he had a tiny white patch on his chest. He was bad tempered simply because she and I couldn't resist dressing him up in our doll's dresses. We would stuff his black paws into little pink cardigans, cram a knitted bonnet over his furious flattened back ears, and then pin him down, yowling in protest in our doll's pram with a shawl tucked firmly in under the little mattress. Then we'd push him around over the bumpy ground. These games always ended in tears as he finally struggled free, hissing and growling and clawed us savagely when we tried to retrieve the clothes from his furry black body as he bolted off down the driveway. My little sister had a cat called Bird's Bath. She was given a grey and white kitten for her sixth birthday, and we were all sitting on the front veranda before lunch, admiring it. 
What are you going to call it? asked Mum. My sister looked nonplussed and then gazing around at our inquiring faces, looking for help, and gazed around at our inquiring faces, looking for help. Frantically, she searched around in her head for a name, and finally, in desperation, she stared around her. Bird's bath, she said triumphantly, as her eye fell on a stone basin placed on a pedestal in a flower bed at the bottom of our big lawn for that very purpose. Bird's bath? Diana and I had similar... <coughs> Excuse me, this cold won't leave me. Diana and I had simultaneously exclaimed, echoing the word with delighted disbelief. But then we caught Mum's eye, and she just pressed her lips together and shook her head. We both exploded into ill-concealed mirth and had to stagger off, snorting and giggling, to recompose ourselves out of sight behind a bush of sweetly scented rills, red salvia flowers. So, my sisters ran to find Vesper and Bird's Bath, and I headed for the sheds to try and round up the half dozen or so semi-wild stable cats which lived outside, earning their place in the hierarchy of our farm animals by keeping the rat population down. Scratched, bloodied, and struggling with our cats we staggered into the dairy where we thought we could keep them locked up for the next 10 days. In the ensuing excitement, as the gang of Basutus settled in and the shearing went into full swing, we forgot all about our cats, which was just as well, because Mackay had already let them out when he went in to operate the hand-turned separator to get some cream for supper. Our 5,000 head or so he our 5,000 or so head of merino sheep were rounded up from all corners of the ranch and herded into the shed a hundred at a time. Each Basutu shearer grabbed one, manhandled it into the stables next door and wrestled it to the ground. There, he expertly gripped his sheep between his knees while, with lightning speed, he clipped its wool away with a pair of hand shears. Within minutes, the bewildered and newly shorn sheep, now looking skinny, half their previous size, and sporting a brand new, pale, cream-coloured suede-looking skin, was allowed to scramble to its feet and was then promptly grabbed by one of our Zulu labourers who branded it with R for Ross in silver paint. It then had its mouth wrenched open with a special but rather crude looking long oval metal instrument and a dollop of bright turquoise powder, some sort of copper sulphate treatment against internal parasites was unceremoniously shoved into, into its mouth before the sheep was released. Sheep then bounded off to join its shorn mates, leaping high like a startled antelope, unused to the new feeling of anti-gravity without its heavy fleece to encumber it. My and my sister's contribution to shearing was to help our labourers trample wool. About ten enormous hessian sacks were each suspended by four strong hooks from beams which crisscrossed under the stable's thatch and had bundles of wool tossed into them by the sorter's assistant. Each sack was marked in red paint with letters and numbers stenciled onto its side to show what grade of wool it contained. 
The white sorter stood at a long slatted wooden table, greasy from many years, layers of lanolin, and graded each fleece as his basutu assistant flung it open along the table, creamy white shorn side up. They both trimmed the rough edge by simultaneously moving around the table, pulling the dirty wool off with their hands. And th these included the dags, the Australian name for that dirty wool, which hangs around a sheep's bum. And the assistant then bundled it up, still shorn side up, ran to the sack and threw it in. We climbed up into the sacks, pulling ourselves up the side like monkeys and jumped into the soft, warm wool. We spent hours in there, ostensibly tramping round and round in our bare feet, compacting the wool to make room for more. But in reality, we sat there in the semi-dark, our sacks rocking gently to and fro as more and more fleeces were dumped on top of us. The slightly dusty hessian sack scent mingled nicely with the sweet hay and sheep smell of the wool. And we found the constant clip, clip, clipping sounds of sheep shears pleasantly soporific. We dozed comfor comfortably to the background of constant bowing and the Basutu shearers singing softly, their deep voices rising and falling in harmony, enchanting, sorry, chanting unknown melodies sung in a strange language. When we were eventually flushed out by Evelina at bath time, our legs and feet were covered in lanolin from the wool and felt deliciously soft and smooth. This is chapter five, summer days. In the summer, there would be a flurry of activity the day the school, schools closed for the long, hot Christmas break. When St Anne's prep broke up and Nicolette came home, there had to be a reshuffle of bedrooms. I had to leave my room and move to the spare room, kept for important visitors for the school holidays. And Evelina, my Zulu nanny, bustled my clothing out of the end room and into the spare room. Nicolette, Diana and Delia each had their own bedroom, but I didn't. Unbelievably, from early on, I'd been the baby who didn't cry during the night. And as a reward for being so amenable, I'd been allocated to mum and dad's dressing room off their bedroom, while my sisters were given the remaining three bedrooms well out of earshot. When Nicolette went off to St Anne's at the age of five, I was relocated to her bedroom at the furthest end of the passage and had to move into the spare room when she came back on back for holidays. It was at the St Anne's Diocesan Preparatory, Preparatory School for Girls, the prep, next to the college on the outskirts of Hilton, used to be called Hilton Road. It was run by two tyrannical and dreary middle-aged spinsters, Miss Grindley and Miss Turnbull, who were strictly Victorian in their outlook. The food was terrible too, all of which we would discover for ourselves when we arrived there one by one in the years to come. We would drive down to Hilton Road now Hilton, an attractive village perched on the plateau which overlooks Peter Maritzburg, the big sprawling capital city of Zululand and Natal, to fetch her. The drive took about three quarters of an hour and they came back at lunchtime. 
Nicolette's huge school trunk in the boot of the car. This was removed by our two nannies and the contents whisked off to be laundered. She was dressed in her uniform of pale blue cotton dress, brown clout sandals and a white Panama hatch, hat perched on her dark curly hair with the school badge prominently displayed. We were insatiably curious and asked Nicolette endless questions about boarding school. She was quite reticent and soon got fed up with our interrogation and would walk off. Dine, as she was nicknamed by us, and I mocked and jeered, rolling around on the grass at our own hilarious jokes at her expense. Then we lost interest and went back to our games with our dolls and fairies, which we played all year round. At that stage, none of us three sisters were going to any school of any kind. Nicolette found all our giggling, Delia baiting and minor squabbles irritating. We didn't know how traumatic it had been for her at the age of five to be wrenched away from our remote farm and very isolated family, to be thrust into a big dormitory full of strange girls. Coming home to find her irresponsible, immature and extremely annoying younger sisters as her only companions must have been awful for her and she became slightly aloof and withdrawn. At least all the girls at school were in the same boat. They could commiserate with one another about their hardships and she'd formed close friendships with most of them. With our clowning around and never taking anything seriously, we were impossible to in communicate with and simply couldn't identify with her situation. She was clearly lonely, missed her friends, although she was delighted to be away from that dreadful school and became more and more detached from the three of us. I was pleased when Nicolette came home, although we rather resented the fuss mum made of her, especially on the occasions when she came back for the day on Sunday outings from school, three each term. She was allowed treats, such as the best bit of the roast leg of mutton, the tail, a delicious crispy morsel for which we all competed vociferously. It's my turn, I'd wail as the delicacy was put onto Nicolette's plate. I knew as well as Diane did that she'd managed to get the tail the last time and the Pope's nose of the chicken the Sunday before. I didn't even like the Pope's nose. To me, lamb's tails and chickens' bums were two entirely different things, but I felt it was an infringement of my civil rights to be passed over, so I tried to keep up, kick up a fuss anyway. It's no wonder our parents made us eat in the nursery with our nannies the rest of the time. Let it immediately changed into a t-shirt, shorts like the rest of us, and we sat down to lunch in the dining room. Usually we ate in the nursery with all, with our Zulu nannies. But on the odd occasion like this one, we were allowed to eat with our parents. Our Zulu chef, Masango, had roasted a chicken, a big treat. One chicken could feed a family of six and there would still be enough left over to make an adequate curry or stew the next day. And the flavor was quite delicious. This came from our flock of fowls, which scratched around, scratched about in an enclosure behind the veggie garden. And Diane and I used to trail after Masango 
as he carried his big firewood axe over to the fowl run with its hen house. This was firmly barricaded against nocturnal predators such as wild cats and spotted genets, which could slip through the smallest opening. If its skull can fit through a hole, then it can get in, said Grandpa, and slaughter the entire flock in one night. We would help an impassive Masango round up and catch a big, nice cockerel, and then stand by to watch as he removed his tall, starched, white chef's hat, flung it on a fence post, holding up the wire which surrounded the chicken run, and taking a firmer grip on the squawking fowl's body, summarily lay it on a nearby tree stump and chopped its head off with a single swift blow. He would then release it, and the body twitched and leapt about entertainingly, headless and spraying blood everywhere. For some odd reason, we thought this was fascinating, seeing the tiny head still lying there on the tree stump, while the rest of the fowl performed its gruesome dance. We would also regularly, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> sorry, we would also, also sorry, <coughs> I apologize. We would also regularly go over to the sheds to watch one of our sheep being slaughtered for the house. One of our Zulu farm staff laid it on its side and held its body down with one knee, its legs kicking frantically. He pinned its head to the ground and sawed at its throat with a rather blunt kitchen knife. After a lot of bleating, which finally changed to gurgle, blood cascaded from the unfortunate creature's jugular. When the animal had subsided into death with one final jerk of its legs, the Zulu and his workmate hung the carcass up by its back feet from a strong wire hook tied to the low branch of a gum tree, which grew conveniently near to a water standpipe tap, and the skinning began. Once they'd cut out its stomach, one of the Zulus took it turned it inside out and washed off most of the chewed, green, slimy looking contents under the tap. He popped slices of the raw tripe into his mouth and ate it with relish. He offered some to us, but Dine and I recoiled with disgust. The rest of the tripe was sent out was sent to our house along with the best cuts of meat, as Dad loved tripe and onions, but I couldn't stand even the smell of it cooking. That's all for this week. Hope you enjoyed it. You'll find photographs on my website, www.whitezulu.com. And I want to thank John Mos Lane for being my sound engineer and for helping me do these recordings. Without him, this would not be possible. So thank you, John. Thank you too for watching my chapters or my channel. And I wish you everything of the best. Thank you and goodbye.